Welcome to the Take the North podcast. I'm David Hoff on the Mullen and Haas show on 670 The Score. Dan Wieters from the Chicago Tribune and also from The Score. Big news on the Bears beat. Two veterans who have been with the Bears longer than any other Bears, I believe. The two longest tenured Bears have been released. Eddie Jackson and Cody Whitehair. Dan, I think that obviously both are salary moves, money moves. I wonder what your reaction is. We'll talk about the implications. But first, how surprised were you when the news came across on Thursday afternoon? Yeah, for, first of all, Patrick Scales, the longest tenured bear currently ah. there. Part of the, the list of guys that that are or were residents of House Hall that had been to a playoff game. <laughs> you know, and, and so uh, the news doesn't come as a huge surprise. It is still significant because you're removing two guys that were without question, successful draft picks of the previous regime of Ryan Pace, guys that were drafted in Cody's case in round two, Eddie's case in round four, and paid dividends. They're on a a very short list, David, and I can give you the list right now uh, of players drafted uh, by Ryan Pace that made it to a second contract with the Bears and played on a second contract with the Bears. It's a list that it's Eddie Goldman, it's Cody Whitehair, it's Deion Bush, it's DeAndre Houston Carson, Eddie Jackson, and Cole Komet. Tariq Cohen sort of on that list because he did get an extension, but he got hurt before he was able to uh, make it to that extension. And so it's a a very short list of guys that uh, were picked, materialized into what the Bears thought they were going to be, and then played at a level to to stick around for a while. Cody Whitehair uh, earned himself a captaincy. Eddie Jackson earned himself a captaincy. And both players were were very widely respected in that locker room. Uh, A lot to unpack. I know we'll kind of keep it short on the farewells here, but but obviously a, a move that gets the Bears uh, close to $22 million in cap savings as they head toward the free agent market of March. Not insignificant there. Fair or unfair, Eddie Jackson, as a Bear, peaked as a rookie. No, he peaked in his second year. He peaked okay. in his second year in the division championship year of 2018. It's interesting, David, because um, I believe you were, you were still at the Trib in, in 2019, correct? Yes. So we do that panel where we selected our our top 100 bears going into the 100th season of of the bears in the nfl and eddie jackson was on such an upward trajectory after his first two seasons that he checked in at number 81 overall on our top 100 list of bears you look at what he was doing those first two seasons with the takeaways and the eight interceptions and the four fumble recoveries and the five touchdowns and we just thought the window was opening for a long career of of sustainable uh production in the secondary and then he obviously had the fall off in production in 1920 and 21 got back to a decent level in 2022, played pretty solid, went healthy in 2023. But as you know, you've covered this league a long time. Life comes at you really fast in the NFL. And now Eddie Jackson uh, packs up his locker and heads out the door to uh, to a new beginning. Let me try another one, which is a little <laughs> bit more subjective. True or false, Eddie Jackson got paid and then he became less physical. Um. Unfair? I don't know. I, yeah, a little bit. I don't know that the, the two go hand in hand. I think obviously physicality was something that that was lacking uh, in his game at times. But Eddie, at his best, was a ball hawk. You know, when you think back to that run in 2018, um, I, I I start actually in 2017 on the, the 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 game in October where he had the the first half touchdowns of 75 yards or more, two of them, one a fumble right. return, one an interception return. One of the things I fondly remember about that day is that John Fox was so proud, not only of Eddie Jackson's emergence as a rookie, but that he won a football game in the NFL in the 21st century in a game in which his quarterback threw seven passes. Mitch Trubisky <laughs> was four for seven for 107 yards on that day, and the Bears didn't need to do anything else because Eddie Jackson put the ball in the end zone twice, and it was sort of that opening uh, – of the door to, okay, when, when you have a defensive playmaker like this, you got to capitalize. And, and you, you know, well, now uh, we talked about it when Eddie was presented the good guy award in December, he's one of the, the favorite players I've had to cover in that locker room. And I have a great amount of respect for him. Obviously the consistency of production wasn't where it needed to be. And now as he gets later in his career and the bears look to build something for, for the future, he becomes the latest uh, casualty of, of the business. It is a casualty of the business. It is a, it is a fact of NFL life. I also think that, you know, maybe that is an unfair question to ask, but I do think I'll stop asking questions and make statements. Eddie Jackson, to me, was a disappointing player for his last several years with the Bears because I don't feel like he lived up to the salary. I don't think that he was worth what they were paying him. I don't think he was as impactful as he was his first couple of years in the league when he raised the expectations that he was going to be 
a consistent difference maker. I'm not sure he always was. I think that he was unwilling as a tackler at times, or if he was not unwilling, he wasn't the most sound of tacklers. And I think uh, physicality wasn't always a part of his game. He certainly did have good awareness. He certainly was a great guy to have in the locker room. But I do look at this move and think that if you're the Bears and you want to have an elite defense, you have to have an elite sta- you have to have elite standards. And I think at this point in time, it makes sense for me to me to move on from Eddie Jackson. Well, particularly when you look at the numbers, the dollars and cents sometimes uh, are, are a very reliable compass on what you need to do in that situation. I will uh, not push back vehemently on anything you just said there. I will say that um, that presence that he had in that locker room and the, the 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 way he was respected by fellow defenders is important. And 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 you know. Uh, as well as I do, that Jaquan Brisker really latched on to Eddie Jackson for the first two seasons of his career and used him as a guide and a mentor and, and somebody that has helped him get his career off to a, a, a promising start. And so Jaquan Brisker is now going to have to take that torch and pay it forward to uh, potentially do a young player that they put in the back end or if they decide to sign a, another veteran safety there to pair with them, then it's just about recreating that chemistry as best he can. It's a good point. It's fair. We'll hear that a lot in – OTAs and training camp and certainly in, in uh, the, the build up and ramp up to next season. I do think that and, and as someone who has done this before and, and will probably do it again, I do think we tend to overstate those things when it comes to players as good as Jaquan Brisker, as good as, you know, offensively. I think we're going to go through this similar thing when, if they trade Justin Fields, it's going to be well, you know, we're going to see how DJ Moore reacts and how Cole Komet reacts and what these guys say about, oh, my, Justin Fields is really good in the locker room. All that is true. Fact of the matter is this is a losing football team. It's a losing organization, and you have to make these tough moves. Okay. Guys become attached, but Jaquan Brisker could have a Pro Bowl season next year with or without Eddie Jackson. No doubt. And I but, think that's part of it too. Yeah, I just, I just think that, that that was a valuable relationship that they they were lucky enough that those two guys really hit it off. Uh, and then you know you flash over to the other side of the ball and you see Cody Whitehair after eight seasons here as a Bear and uh, the amount of selflessness he showed of being willing at a, a moment's notice to uh, shift from center to guard to center to guard to guard to center and, and all of the things that he was willing to do to be flexible and useful for the Bears. Uh, it's time just ran out here, but I think when you, when you consider what the bears thought he was on draft night in 2016 and what they were able to squeeze out of him for eight seasons, it's a pretty promising run, uh, by a guy who carried himself with the professional standards that, that they're looking to infuse all throughout that locker room. And so, uh, it's another guy that will, will walk out the building with his, uh, head held high and with, with mass amounts of respect from the people that worked alongside him. Easy guy to respect, came in with uh, a great attitude and really played uh, wherever they, they really wanted him to. And I, I'm surprised at how his season went. I don't know what happened to him. Psychologically, you wonder if it was something about playing the center position that get the best of him. I don't know. But I do think um, this also makes sense because of the money. Obviously, it was necessary. I wonder if he's got a future in the league. Dan, we see offensive linemen hang around for a long time. Some guys just – they fall off the, the, the cliff quickly. Um, not quite sure what to expect from Cody Whitehair, but he has been a great guy in the locker room, consummate leader. And uh, he'll be missed for an offensive line in terms of the leadership aspect and the versatility. Curious about what you think of the, the move will be at free safety and what this does to, number one, draft needs and where the, they prioritize that position or – okay – Play with me for a minute here. Go with me, my meatball thought. Antoine Winfield Jr. is a free agent. His price tag would probably be around $18 million a year. I don't know if you can pay Jalen Johnson and a guy like that in your secondary because of the disparity, but I also know that you might be looking at a rookie contract that affords you some luxuries you might might not have. What do you think about that possibility? Is that a dream? Is that reality? What that seems more more like a dream to me. I think if I'm doing this practically from the seat that Ryan Pohl sits in, I am using the third wave of free agency to find myself a veteran option that can come in on a, on a cheaper, uh, prove-it type of deal. And then if you get to the draft and the board falls in a way that allows you to, to draft a guy there, then you can play that game where you, you you are not drafting out of need, but you're drafting out of value and you see somebody that can help you there. Um, we'll have a lot more time as we get closer to free agency to talk about the plans. My sense right now, David, is that this team is going to be a lot less 
aggressive in making the big expenditures in free agency. To your point, they need some money stowed away to, to pay Jalen Johnson. They used some money already to pay Montez Sweat. I think you're going to be kind of looking for, um, you know, second and third wave guys that, that provide value for you there. Uh, and then if there is a, a big splash to be made, you want that to be at a premium position, whether that be pass rusher uh, or potentially receiver or somebody that can can uh, be an instant, immediate difference maker at a position that really takes you to the next level. OK, I will be quiet about the 25 year old Pro Bowl safety from the Buccaneers uh, on the open market. As I covered Antoine as... Winfield's father. So like, I, I, I know a little, yeah, he was yeah. Uh, a great guy to teach you the game, too. Well, if they. Bring Jalen Johnson back. I think that's fine. I understand why they would have to, you know, use the budget in, accordingly. If they lose Jalen Johnson, I would hope that they're all in on a guy like Winfield just to have a difference maker impact guy in the secondary. I think it's got to be for me either or. It, I don't expect them to lose Jalen Johnson. I think the, the consensus is that they're going to try hard to make a deal. Ryan Pohl said he's not going anywhere. But if somehow that falls through, they can pivot quickly to put all those resources in that direction. And I think that if you get Winfield in that secondary, that would be a nice way to recover from losing Jalen Johnson. In the team photo of uh, safeties, I regularly enjoy talking to Eddie Jackson, David Haw, and Antoine Winfield Sr. are all in that photo. So there you go. <laughs> Only <laughs> Which one didn't play in the NFL? Okay. <laughs> that's just, it's just safeties. It doesn't that's, even, a, that, you know, that's, a, that's a source I've got spot. a safety from my fourth grade okay. flag football team that okay. I, you know, I enjoy talking You're right. to. So. That's a safety. What do you think that um, the opening on the uh, offensive line, it, was that it, just – those resources are going to devote to replacing Cody Whitehair because they need a swing guy. What is that a, a negligible loss? How do you view that? Well, yeah, look, obviously Cody wasn't in the mix toward the end of this last season. Uh, I think the interior of that offensive line is going to need to get upgraded a little bit. You know, you, you, you figure that they're going to try to figure out a way to get a veteran center in here, uh, particularly with, with some of the things that you're trying to do at the quarterback position. Um, and then you've just got to kind of feel it out with Tevin Jenkins and Nate Davis in terms of their reliability and whether you're trying to, to bring in competition or whether you're trying to bring in depth there. Um, but that's going to be a priority for them in this, this next uh, six to eight weeks. The question people will have big picture wise, when they look at the release of two you know, pretty good bears. You can live with the release of white hair because he didn't really contribute last year that much. Can the bears defense that finished the season as strong as it was, can the bears defense be elite by replacing Eddie Jackson? Will it still be at the same level or will they have to take a step back because they're losing his savvy and experience? Oh, I mean, the, the, the savvy and experience is real and that's valuable, um, but you figure you're going to be able to upgrade in, in other areas and you're going to be able to complement the defense that was already coming along very well. And now we'll have uh, Eric Washington to bring him along to another step. And, and, and here you go. You know, you've got chances to, to make a step up. I wouldn't expect them to regress, uh, but Eddie's absence is something that you got to compensate for. Now you just got to put that puzzle together, however it makes sense. And that's up to, to Ryan Poles. And it will be up to Matt Eberflus to have his A in that matter as well. Did Ryan Pace have a draft pick that was any better than Eddie Jackson? Well, I remember at one point writing a story about how there was like a, it was like a 22 minute span in which the bears drafted both Eddie Jackson and Tariq Cohen. And there was a point uh, in 2018 where, where you were like, man, like that's a, a steal of a 22 minutes on, on day three of the draft to get two guys that were all pros, you know, Tariq as a uh, punt returner and, and Eddie as a safety. Um, no, I mean, it's hard to go down that list and find many that were, that were better than Eddie Jackson in terms of what Ryan did. I think we're down to seven left on the current roster that includes Justin Fields, includes Larry Borum and includes Khalil Herbert. And so we're, we're running out of guys that, that Ryan Pace had ties to, uh, but certainly Eddie and Cody were, were two of the better ones. Who did the Bears draft in the first round that year of 2017? Uh, I don't recall. Tr Brown <laughs> okay, Steve. enough. enough and then round two, I think, was your guy, Adam Shaheen. <laughs> Adam Shaheen. Oh, my. They, <laughs> that was the George Kittle draft, too. And Mitch, Mitch out of work this week. That's the unfortunate development. I can't wait to see him land in Kansas City next to Matt Nagy, and they can both make money and laugh together. All right, so – that's the personnel moves. Anything else about Eddie Jackson or Cody Whitehair, Dan, before we move on to what Kevin Warren had to say? No, I mean, I think my last thing on Eddie is just if you remember the glory 
stretch of 2018 when the Bears won nine out of 10. You've got the touchdown that Eddie scored in Buffalo. You've got the touchdown he scored to uh, seal the, the primetime win against the Vikings. And four days later, he scores the touchdown at Ford Field on Thanksgiving. It just felt, you remember the Bears danced to everything hashtag and how the whole world felt brighter in Chicago because the defense was doing everything they were doing. Eddie was a, a big catalyst to that. And so that's just a, a nostalgic look back to a period of time that we are now trying to recreate with a new regime trying to take this team to new levels. And that's what Kevin Warren is trying to do, obviously, both on and off the field. Made news this week. He sat down with a couple different guys. He We mentioned Brandon Polk from WCIU. Uh, also, Marshall Harris from CBS2 had a, an interview with Kevin Warren. The one that made the loudest noise and the biggest impact probably was his sit-down in Las Vegas with Jarrett Payton, yeah. friend of the score, regular guest on the Mullen Haw Show, and Kevin Warren sat down for an interview with WGN TV, and it was a it was Kevin Warren being Kevin Warren. I, I don't know if there was a big headline that was anything that was definitive, but there were some interesting clues that he probably left, and we can interpret what he said and the way that you probably you know each person's going to interpret it differently. But Dan, I'll let you take it from here because obviously uh, there are three different things I think we heard him say. One was talk about his view of Justin Fields. The other one was about the latest with the stadium project. And finally about his relationship with Ryan Poles. We'll start with the Justin Fields piece. I was going to say, let's just start with the quarterback. Let's listen to what Kevin had to say directly to a question. Jared asked him about his views on, on who Justin Fields is and has been. Uh, and then we can take it from there. Here's Kevin Warren talking about JF one QB one for now. Well, from my standpoint, and I, I come to the table, I'm a um, supporter of Justin you know, because I got a chance to work with him when I was commissioner of the Big Ten Conference. He is incredibly talented. Uh, he is smart. Uh, he works hard. And uh, he wants to be a great NFL football player. Um, and, and so now he just needs to make sure that he has the support around him. He's working hard. And then I would love to see him, you know, this offseason, make sure he's totally healthy going into the season next year. Um, you know, this is a difficult game. And if you, and if you think about professional sports, but let's talk about professional football. It's an incredibly difficult game. And then when you think about the quarterback position, it is, it, it is, it's difficult. And so, um, and it's, you know, Justin has a rare combination of intelligence, of size, of strength and speed. You forget how big of a, of a man he is until you're up on him. He's not a small man. And, um, and so I just think every year he's going to continually get better. Um, and um, so I'm glad he's on the Chicago Bears. Pretty high praise, effusive even, for uh, from Kevin Warren, who didn't have to lay it on that thick. Dan, my take was that he definitely was sincere in how he feels about Justin Fields. If I was surprised at all, it might have been in how how much he laid it on, how heavy he laid it on, because of the implications that he's certainly aware of. I wondered if it was, you know, as much as he feels strongly about Justin Fields, was it a, a, an attempt to gain some leverage to let everyone know how much the Bears value him? Uh, at the same time, their relationship does go back uh, years, and it predates their Bears connection. So I don't want to question the sincerity either. What did you think? Certainly gave the outside world uh, reason to, to continue yelling at each other at uh, high decibel levels about what the Bears' plans at quarterback are going to be. I don't think I read anything into their actual plans at the position. I think Kevin has a very profound and sincere respect for who Justin is as a person, as a worker. Uh, I don't think anything he said in that uh, soundbite was a fib. Um, I think it's just a matter of the Bears working through this and figuring out what they want to do to make their team a championship team. Uh, I think it's really easy, as you know, in, in February to take every little nugget of every little morsel of every little crumb that's out there and try to draw grand conclusions. The Bears are going to have a decision here within a matter of two and a half months. They don't play a meaningful football game again for another seven months. We're going to get our answers and we'll look back on this period of time, this four month period of time with with probably great awe about the number of things that that threw people into a tizzy or caused widespread debate or caused reaction. This to me was simply a, a team president answering a direct question with a deep and reflective answer. Um, and so I wouldn't read into it 
much more than that. And I'm sure that our mentions will get filled up with a, a lot of response to just that. <laughs> I I agree with everything you just said. I, I do wonder if it would have even created a ripple if he would just would have been a little less effusive. Now I, I the, the, the one the one thing that I I, I kind of if I was coaching him in the moment that would have thrown up at least a yellow light too was saying and we're glad that he's a Chicago Bear because that's, that's certain, it. That was the last you know kind of the the mic drop that gave everyone reason to to draw grand conclusions when I don't think even the team is. Uh, drawn those grand conclusions. And so, um, you know, we'll see which direction it goes. So here we are moving ahead to the Bear Stadium project, and it reaches a very critical phase this week because there's a deadline on Saturday. And it comes up because on Wednesday, the Cook County Board of Review informed the Bears that they made a decision to leave the property's value at $192 million. And that's the property, of course, in Arlington Heights. <laughs> so the Bears and the school districts in Arlington Heights in that in, in, in the county remain a hundred million dollars apart about their tax val or the, the value of the property, the assessed value of the property, and that's 326 acres that basically lead to this dispute of what it is worth and how many taxes they're going to pay and what the uh, price of the Bears basically will have to build on that site. Saturday is the, the deadline. Uh, they can negotiate out of that deadline the way I understand it and extend it. But, Dan, this is not the direction the Bears wanted this to go. I think there might have been an expectation there would be a little bit more wiggle room. Um, they could still come to a settlement, but they would have to meet in a place where they have been yet to find common ground. The Board of Review stood firm on this one and uh, essentially challenged the Bears and the school districts out in the suburbs to try to get their heads together and, and find middle ground in some of this. You know, we, we've, we've talked about this property, 326 acres. The Bears bought it for, uh, I think, more than $197 million. They, they have seen it valued now by the Cook County Assessor at 192, and they want it valued at 60 or 71 million, which are two numbers that have come up uh, in their negotiations. They've got to get their heads together with the school district in the suburbs and try to find their way to uh, building a bridge, you know, because neither side, in my opinion, benefits from having this thing just go poof, <laughs> you know, and after all this time spent uh, on that land and envisioning what could be there, if not only for the bears, but for the people in that area and, and, and what that could bring into their communities, it would be wild to see this thing fizzle out. Now, look, I think on, on social media, there's been a lot of grand conclusions drawn to what this latest decision by the Cook County Board of Review actually means. This is a uh, long journey and stadiums have a lot of uh, financial dynamics and political dynamics and negotiating dynamics that the Bears have to um, push behind Kevin Warren to solve. And that's why he was brought here. Uh, and so look, ultimately, Kevin, and we'll talk about this more as we talk about the, the, the general manager position as well. He's got to produce results before we take his words as anything more than words. Uh, at the same time, until there's an actual result on one side or another, it's also a little bit foolish to jump to any conclusions. Yeah, and that's why what he had to say to Jarrett Payton was interesting in Vegas because, as we know, there was another story two weeks ago from Crane Chicago Business, how the Bears have shifted their focus to the south lot, lakefront property, right south of Soldier Field, which logistically, certainly a lot of people would love uh, from a standpoint of would it accomplish what the Bears originally set out to do. I guess maybe we're reading into that, but they own their own stadium. That would be more difficult in the city of Chicago than it would be in Arlington Heights. So it doesn't make a ton of sense or as much sense to me. And that's why, to me, it was always – and still remains to um, a, a more of a leverage ploy in my mind. Could be wrong, right. but that patch of land does not seem like it would be as appealing, even though it's in the city, it's where the Bears belong, but it doesn't allow them, would not permit them to own their own stadium. So he sat down with Jarrett Payton in Las Vegas. Jarrett asked him about the stadium project, and this is how part of their conversation went. I think the timeline, yeah, it has to be in 2024. I mean, in a perfect world, uh, I would like to, to have clarity in this legislative session that's coming up. Uh, time is money and, um, you know, it takes probably three years once you put a shovel in the ground. And so, you know, this is one of those ones, I think 24, um, you know, should be the focal point. You know, this is the year. 
this is the year. So the legislative uh, session officially adjourns May 24th. Got to have a decision, a site, a date by then, don't we, Dan? Well, it seems to be the ideal timeline. Now there's some wiggle room there. And and certainly that's the first time that, that I've heard Kevin uh, be as emphatic as he was and in, in, in sort of saying, look, like we've got to get to the end of choosing a site here pretty soon. You know, and now people on the outside have to understand that the Bears aren't just sitting there uh, with their, their hands in their pockets going, oh, well, you know, we don't have, like plans are ongoing. You know, there's stadium design plans and, and development discussions going at all times. Obviously, Arlington Heights is the property they own. They're far along that if they chose tomorrow that that's the site they want to build on. It's not like they're just starting right from there. If they have to pivot and go to a, a, a site in the city, they'll do that as well. The other thing that, David, that's really interesting in this to me is, you know, Kevin understands that part of his role is to apply pressure in these situations and to be able to, you know, go on television, conduct an interview, have his thoughts expressed, have his thoughts talked about in a lot of different areas. It creates conversation that essentially uh, you're hopeful if you're the Bears helps to move things in a direction that, that they help ultimately wanted to go in. We'll see what the results are. Um, but I, I, I do think like to your point of, of talking about leverage and, and strategy, like this is, this is part of it, right. Is to, is to get on camera and to, to make things uh, spoken to the outside world so that, that it creates a little bit of, of uh, urgency and action, uh, so to speak. And I think the urgency and action is also interesting to examine from another perspective. And I talked about this uh, on the Mullion Hawes show, and I think I've mentioned it here before, but it was Bears repeating. When you talk about the leverage that the Bears could gain by maintaining the South Lot site as a possibility, as an alternative, you also have to consider what's going on simultaneously, potentially, with the White Sox. The White Sox are eyeing a patch of land called the 78 in the South Loop. They want to build a stadium there. They have renderings of the new stadium. It's beautiful. It looks great. And as a Sox, a rendering. it's a great <laughs> rendering. And, and so you have a South Loop project being eyed by Jerry Reinsdorf. You have a South Lot project being eyed by Kevin Warren. There's a little clause that was built into the legislature in 2021 about the funding mechanism and how to go about this with bonds and public involvement in this that is only, I think, valid until the end of this calendar year. I don't think it would apply to both projects. I think it would be one or the other, the way I understand it now. There's a lot of weeds to, to, to get through. There's a lot of minutia to interpret, but the point would be this. There's a virtual race. <laughs> you could view it a virtual race between Jerry Reinsdorf and the White Sox, Kevin Warren and the Bears to make the first announcement, to sign the first agreement, to get to the point where you're eligible for this clause that will allow you to use bond financing as a mechanism to pay for your stadium or to help pay for your stadium. Who's going to kick in more? Can you do both? Unlikely. Really unlikely. Possible? Yes. The Bears don't necessarily have to they could always say, well, we're, we're going to have a, go, a different route. We're going to go a different way. And you could theoretically do that. But it does not seem feasible to me that in the city of Chicago, with everything going on there, that they're going to announce in 2024 this new site of the Bears, which is only about a mile away from the new site of the White Sox. It just doesn't seem practical. So it's going to be one or the other, I think. And it could happen soon. Well said, and maybe we replace those scoreboard races that Duncan likes to do with stadium races. We get, rid of, <laughs> we get rid of Biggie Bagel and a couple coffee, and and we, and we get we get Kevin Warren and Jerry Reinsdorf and whoever else wants to join the race, and we turn that into a little little deal. It sounds like you're on board. Let's get George involved. Uh, he could be on a scooter. <laughs> there you go. All right, so let's get back to football. What did you hear from Kevin Warren as it pertains to his involvement in football matters and his relationship with Ryan Poles? If you'll indulge me, I'd like to talk about this for uh, a few minutes. And I, I, again, I think we'll start out by hearing Kevin talk about his um, kind of relationship with Ryan and what it means in this upcoming stretch. And then we'll we'll talk more about it because I think we need to kind of provide clarity to our audience, uh, certainly pockets of the audience that seem a little bit confused on 
why Kevin is involving himself in, in football operations decisions and, and how he's involving himself in football operations decisions. But let's start out by hearing from Kevin Warren uh, about his connection with Ryan Poles. The thing about our, our Ryan's uh, and I's working relationship is the fact that, you know, we're in this together. Um, and I know he's spending every single day thinking about not only that decision, but who to draft for number nine and our current roster, what we're going to do in free agency. What are we doing from a contract negotiation standpoint? I'm sure he's already starting to play out the draft uh, in his mind. And so, you know, we'll work together. But I have great trust, obviously, in Ryan and our, you know, Ian Cunningham and all of our, our scouts. But this is that crucial time. And they've already been grinding away on it uh, to be able to come together. So I look forward to, you know, going to the combine here later this month and, and then getting the chance to spend some time together. Hmm. I think I may have asked you this. I can't remember if it was on or off the air, but do you recall seeing Ted Phillips at many combines? Well, I saw George McCaskey there more than once. And so I think that there is particularly in the Bears situation where you are perusing the quarterback market, potentially to take a quarterback at number one overall. Um, it doesn't throw me off at all to have your team president around and nearby and, and able to observe and, and give things. Now, listen, Kevin's not going to be sitting in Lucas Oil Stadium writing down notes at the quarterback workout and trying to supersede Ryan on, and his staff on what they're doing with the, the scouting staff. Kevin is there to be a, a sounding board. He's there to be um, what Ted wasn't always capable of being, which is a resource, which is a mentor, as somebody that can um, – provide feedback and and look like we talked about this last summer when I wrote the piece the deep dive piece on who Kevin is and who he's striving to be for the Chicago Bears and it's worth reiterating a lot of this now so people understand why he's taking this role in overseeing football operations and it's to try to get the Bears back on a track where they can compete for championships on a regular basis part of that role is providing productive oversight and guidance to the general manager Ryan Poles, who by his own admission has said on multiple occasions, he really appreciates feedback. He really appreciates open and honest dialogue that challenges him to have a guy that's working side by side with him that has an office right next door and is able to produce some of that feedback and that guidance and, and some of the, the challenging and the question asking that helps you make good decisions is extremely valuable for this organization. We know how much these decisions can shape the future of your organization. 2017, prime example. There wasn't enough oversight and guidance in a draft where the Bears could have changed their fortunes for 15 years or longer if they had made the right decision. Now they're sitting on the, the doorstep of another decision that is absolutely massive for them. And so I have zero issue with Kevin being involved. And I think it's just worth reiterating that involvement does not mean uh, sort of dictatorial guidance, which I think some people are fearful of. I think that's well put. That's a smart way to look at it. Here's my only... I don't even want to call it a concern, but it, the only thing that gives me pause in, in agreeing wholeheartedly with that and, and saying that I have no problem or take issue with it is that I, I, had high, I had high expectations like a lot of people for Kevin Warren in the first year, and it didn't bother me going into the season that he would be overseeing and presiding over Ryan Poles and, and basically football stuff because he's been through organizations and with organizations where that's, you know, they've been successful. I get that disappointed me with the coaching search it really disappointed me that the raw the, the the rhetoric was lofty and the goals have always been like they're going to build this dream stadium and they're going to think bigger and imagine what's unimaginable and however he has worded it it's always sounded too good to be true almost and then when they have an opportunity from the outside to at least think big to swing for the fences to look at some of the great coaches out there available, they embraced their guy. They brought Matt Eberflus back, who you could defend, and I, I I do like Flusie, but I think with Jim Harbaugh out there, with other coaches out there that were considered upgrades, upgrades, they didn't do what the Cubs did, for example, and going from David Ross to Craig Council, they settled, and I just did never, I never expected Kevin Warren to be a settler. And so that's the only reason I would hesitate a little bit with agreeing with you wholeheartedly while the spirit of what you're saying is valid. Kevin Warren's got every right to be involved in every football decision moving forward because he is a team president and he does have the credibility to, to have his input matter. I just am a little bit still 
probably still stung by the lack of ambition shown by the way had they treated the head coaching position this offseason. That's all fair. And I think that Kevin has empowered his general manager to have the final say on those decisions, which I think is what everyone in Chicago wants to have happen. You want to have a power structure where the person in charge is able to make those decisions with the right amount of, of again, guidance and oversight. I go back to a conversation I had with Ryan Poles uh, last summer when we were talking about his, at that time, budding relationship with Kevin. And he just said that, look, like he appreciates having um, – someone in the room that will challenge ideas that will, will challenge thoughts and, and, and push for the organization collectively to make sound decisions. And when you have that, when you have that uh, person that's, that's capable of, of asking questions and, and pushing you in a direction that makes you think about things, Ryan said, look, like now I go into processes with big decisions I have to, to make anticipating the kinds of questions that Kevin is going to ask me and having those answers before he asks me the first time. And this is all about what we've talked about previously about what leadership looks like, what leadership feels like. It's stuff that you may never see in the results, but if it's helping the processes that lead to the results, then you, you, you embrace that, it and you that, value that, it. That's the key. That's the key thing. That is the key thing that they didn't have before. I think. Right. And, it, it, you know, it's the passion that adds adds to the fuel that that adds to that. And, and you know, it, it really struck me when when, you know, Ryan just said, like, look, like I'm I'm now thinking at a deeper level, anticipating what my boss is going to ask of me. You know, and that that's that's the goal here. It's to get people that you have already in the building and others that, that are going to be joining the organization over time to be at their best and to push them to be at their best in ways that they might not realize that they needed to be pushed to be at their best, removing blind spots, creating guardrails. I've always talked about the, the 2017 quarterback search in retrospect as one that just didn't have guardrails. And Ryan Pace and, and his staff drove the car right off the side of the cliff. And you went, oh God, like it would have been really nice to have some guardrails at some point during that process. Well, now you have that a little bit. And Kevin's goal and being that leader is to provide some of that structure and that and that guidance that that is so absolutely invaluable that to some people that that can't process it on a deeper level just they they can't grasp well, well what is he doing here what is what does it actually mean and then there's people in the building that that will tell you okay like i'm i'm capable of doing my job at a higher level but based on changes or tweaks or things that have have been created in healthy discussions or conversations or challenges and questions and, and that's that's what this is all about i mean th again like we cannot overemphasize under, I don't know what the word is. Am I overemphasizing? I don't know We can't state enough how landmark this off season is. You can't overstate season. how important this off season is. You cannot it, overstate that. Cannot, right? right? Like, and, and, and so like the, these decisions are massive. Uh, uh, another thing that, that I, uh, I was going back through my notes of stuff that I didn't use in my story uh, last summer. And, and Ken Chenault, who's a, a close friend of Kevin Warren's former uh, chairman of American Express and somebody that he relies on as a, an executive to help him with decisions, said something to me that was really profound. I said um, something that, that Kevin has been kind of the people that have been around him say, say that uh, his superpower is getting the most out of people. And Ken said his superpower is getting the most out of people who want the most gotten out of themselves and that that was a very important distinction. And Ryan Poles is, is that important distinction that he, he wants to be pushed. He wants to be challenged. And now you have someone willing to do it in a, in a healthy and so far harmonious relationship in a way that hopefully gets the bears better results than they've had in the past. I don't know how you could scoff in that. I've laughed a few times this week because Kevin Warren, um, you know, made an appearance and people are, are, are worried about that. And then, uh, they're just also concerned that he's getting overly involved in football when people have spent years, maybe decades saying, why don't we have somebody that, that's overseeing the general manager that's a little bit more football savvy and has an accurate and a sophisticated knowledge that helps yeah. us make better decisions. If you have qualms with that, I don't know what to tell you. Now, again, I go back to what I said previously with the stadium and other things. Until we see results, we can't prop anyone up on a pedestal, nor can we get out the blowtorch and, and, and blowtorch. And we've got to let some of this stuff play out and then review it for what it is. But I think going into it, understanding the visions, understanding the philosophies, understanding why uh, certain processes and, and dynamics in the machine are in place, it helps us uh, view it through, through the lens that the Bears are viewing it. And it's the fairest way to look at it for a guy who's been on the job less than a year. Uh, I think it will be the end of March. will mark one year on the job, and a lot has happened, and there's a lot more to happen. Anything else, Dan, before we get out of here? i got to get ready for Bedard. 
Oh, yeah, you got a big Conor Bedard game tonight. I'm not going. Huge. I'm watching. I wish I was going. I wish I was more prepared. But I'm telling you what, that kid coming back from a broken jaw, those hockey players are tough. You got your foam finger out. I know that. I saw that before the show. That was nice to see. You're ready to go. So I'm uh, ready. The kid's 18. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't been this excited about a Hawks game since the last time he played Sidney Crosby. <laughs> So there you go. It should be an exciting night. And, uh, you know, pitchers and catchers have reported uh, in Arizona. We got all sorts of stuff happening yeah. in the Chicago sports landscape. And the draft is now, I think we're at, are we at 10 weeks now? I think we're at 10 weeks now before uh, before the biggest night. 10 in weeks. We're 41 minutes into this pod. And I don't think we've said the name Caleb Williams. Have you we? You just said it. You just oh, said my it. gosh. I will I'm also such- tell you. And I'm, I'm getting gonna, all sorts of grief for not saying that they're for, for saying on the radio that on Thursday morning that there really isn't much of a debate in uh, that the Bears are facing at the at the number one spot. So I'm getting I'm a te- lot of pushback. I'm going to tease this right now because I had a conversation yesterday with a longtime NFL talent evaluator, um, and I said, "Look, like there have been years where." me trying to reach out to people around the league to get some feedback on what the bears are doing has been greeted with what you just did a, a, a yawn and like, ah, I'm not, you know, kind of boring, kind of irrelevant. Don't really care. And it was really hard to get people to talk to you this off season, David, everyone is calling back. Everyone is texting back. These conversations keep getting uh, deeper and deeper. And I've got some stuff in the works uh, when we get down to Indianapolis that uh, should be, should drive some conversation. I'm only going to further those conversations, but it is incredible as you know, as well, that, that how willing and engaged people are in talking about the bears quarterback decision, their number one pick and what is at stake for them here in the months ahead. I'm looking forward to that. The combine is right around the corner. The draft is in 70 days and we will be here as things continue to develop on and off the field in this most momentous of off seasons for the Bears. Thank you for watching the Take the North podcast on 670 Scores YouTube page. Thank you for listening on your Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. For producer Adam Sadzinski and Dan Weeder, I'm David Haw. We'll talk to you next time. Great talk. See you out there.